Our Bible reading this morning is Psalm number 3, verses 1 to 8. A Psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear though tens of thousands assail me on every side. Arise, Lord, deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw, break the teeth of the wicked. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. May the Lord bless that reading to our understanding. So, who loves jokes? I've got, I've got one to share with you this morning. Someone actually emailed it to me the other day and I liked it. A lady lost her car keys. When she got to her car, she found her keys locked inside. She then found an old rusty coat hanger on the ground. She looked at it and said, oh, I do not know how to use this. She bowed her head and asked God to send her some help. A minute later, an old motorcycle pulled up and a big bearded man got off his motorcycle and said, lady, do you need help? She replied, oh, yes, please, I must get home. Can you use this hanger to unlock my car. He said, sure, and walked over to the car, and in less than a minute, the car was open. She hugged the man, and through tears said, oh, thank you, God, for sending me such a wonderful person. The man heard her pray and said, look, I am not a wonderful person. I just got out of prison yesterday, and I was in prison for car theft. <laughs> the woman hugged the man again and he said, oh, thank you, God, you even sent me a professional. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was funny. Let us pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for your presence that you're with us. And we ask that through your Holy Spirit, you'd help us open our hearts, that we may hear your voice clearly and see your glory. And teach us the way that we may understand your word from the bottom of our heart. And Jesus, help us to be aware, your, aware of your presence at all times today. Help us be led by your spirit for the man who speaks the word and for the people who hear your word. In your name we pray this. Amen. Uh, this morning we are continuing with the story of David's life. Today we will be looking at Psalm chapter 3 which David himself wrote. When you read it in the Bible, it's actually got a heading, and it is the most interesting heading. It says, it is written when David fled from his son Absalom. Now, let me share with you the story as we begin. This is the context to Psalm chapter 3. David had several sons by different wives. He had the oldest son named Amnon. And there was his third oldest son, Absalom. These two boys were born of different women of David. And Absalom had a beautiful sister named Tamar. Amnon, his half-brother, then fell in love 
with Tamar, and he raped her. This became a huge issue in David's family. Well, when, Dave, when Absalom heard this news, he did not take it very well. He plotted revenge to kill Amnon. Two years later, Absalom got Amnon drunk at a party and killed him. Then Absalom fled to hide in a remote place. David loved Absalom, but he was a king. He could not just let him get away with his crime, though. So Absalom got expelled and banned from the city Jerusalem for three years. Three years later, the king summoned Absalom to Jerusalem, but David did not want to see him, nor be seen with him in public. And now the big trouble came as Absalom returned to the city. Now that Absalom was back in Jerusalem, he became very, very arrogant. He provided for himself a chariot and horses, and wherever he went, he had 50 men to run ahead of him. He loved going to the city where many people would see him. And when he was there, he would sit at the city gate to meet those who were coming to see the king for judgment. Absalom said to them, let me hear your case. Oh, I hear you. I can see you are right in this matter. It's a shame that my father does not have anyone to assist you and hear your case. Well, if I were the judge, then I would give justice to people like you. Now, let me see what I can do to help you. Then he would not let these people bow to him, but instead he shook their hands. And Absalom did this for about four years, and he became very popular with the people of Israel. He was plotting to become a king instead of his father David. One day, Absalom said to David, Father, I would like to go to Hebron, which is the capital, old capital city of Israel to make a sacrifice to God to thank him for bringing me back to Jerusalem. David approved, and Absalom took 200 men with him. When Absalom got to Hebron, he sent messengers to every tribe of Israel to say this. Now, as soon as you hear the sound of trumpet, trumpets, you'll know Absalom has been crowned in Hebron. And many people supported Absalom's rebellion. While this was all happening, David in Jerusalem had no idea. He doubted that his son would do such a thing. Then one day, David had a messenger rushing into his court. He said, my king, your son Absalom and his army started marching towards Jerusalem to take your life. What should we do? Hearing this, David's heart fell. Then he decided to avoid the war and the deaths of innocent people within the city. David mounted his horse with his head covered. And as he walked away with much of his household and 600 troops, he wept, and the people in the city wept. Without knowing where he was going, David left the city. And in this dark hour of his life, David wrote Psalm chapter 3. What Psalm 3 points at is that there are different seasons in our life, and some are really dark where we feel plunged into deep despair, confusion, and fear. David's heart fell when hearing from a messenger that his own son is on his way to take his life. In life, we too have moments like that. 
The message could be a doctor's report. It could be what our spouses say or what our children say. Or it could be what we hear from friends. Our hearts fall because our deep love and trust is betrayed. Or we've always thought that something like that would never happen to us. This morning, do you feel like you're in the season of darkness for some reason? Psalm chapter 3 tells us that there is hope. It shows us how God carries us through the darkest night of our lives. In a dark season, one of the strongest feelings that dominate us is a feeling of anxiety. And this passage particularly talks about how we can deal with a feeling of anxiety in the absent flaws of life. And we see three things in the text. They are the cause of anxiety, the healing of anxiety, and the assurance of the healing. With God's word this morning, I believe that some of us will come out of the other side of the tunnel. So let us begin. Now, let's begin with some facts about anxiety. The researchers say that anxiety is today a common experience. They say this not because they think we should overlook when we feel anxious about something. They say this because the more we think about anxiety, the worse it could feel than what it actually is. According to statistics in Australia, more than 3 million people believe that they have an anxiety issue. And it costs the country more than $80 billion per year. Then what does actual anxiety feel like? How do we know if it is anxiety or stress? A psychologist named Rollo May says something like this. Anxiety is a sense of a fear that is diffused. It is a feeling that is undefinable. Anxious people can't point their fingers on what is actually happening to them. They can't articulate what is going on in their minds. Their nervous system is always on. When we are anxious, we always feel agitated and nervous. We are always restless and scared. Anxious people constantly push themselves and always look around. Here is an example. When you say, someone said such a thing to me and it hurt my feelings and I can't sleep because of that, that's more likely to be stress, not anxiety. But anxiety sounds more like this. I heard that someone said such a thing about me, which is not true. And I am worried if everyone else would think the same about me. I can't trust anyone. Now, do you see the difference between anxiety and stress? As someone puts it this way, stress is, a, is a like a thunderstorm, whereas anxiety is a like a cold drizzle. Thunderstorms come and go, there is a thunder, but when the sun comes out, everything is fine. But anxiety is like a cold drizzle. It is gloomy and raining all the time. Then, what is the cause of anxiety? Psychologists say that we feel anxious when our existence is threatened. What does this mean? Anxiety is caused when we feel that a sense of ourself is under attack. A person gets anxious when something that gives them identity, worth, and security is under attack. And we can see this is what's happening to David. Look at what David says here. Lord, how many 
are my foes. How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. He says, they are my foes. They are against me. They are talking about me. He does not say they are against the nation of Israel, but he says they are against me. He feels that his personhood is under attack. He's attacked by his son, so he feels that his fatherhood is threatened. He's questioning, was I such a bad father or husband that my own son is trying to kill me? And his throne was under attack. So David is questioning himself if he had failed in his career. David now feels that the two most important things in his life that define him are being taken away. And they are being a father and a king. In other words, he feels that his sense of identity, worth, and security is under attack. This morning, are you going through a dark night? Has what was important to you been taken away from you? Do you feel like you failed? David was also in that place at one stage in his life, and he said to himself, I am no longer good enough to be loved. I do not know who I am Anymore, I do not know what the future holds for me. Now today, to some of us, this might be what we say about ourselves. To some of us, this anxiety issue might have been a long time battle. But in the Bible, we see that God came to David in his darkest hour and lifted him up from the depths. And David wrote this psalm to tell us that God will do the same for you. For the anxious issue, anxiety issue, you might have been getting some help from doctors and psychologists. I encourage you to continue to do so. But this morning, the text shows us how we can approach the anxiety issue spiritually and how a sense of self in us can be restored. Let us look at what David does to overcome his anxiety. He says this, You, Lord, are a shield around me. My glory, the one who lifts my head high. Do you see what David is doing here? He's calling on God. He prays. Now, reading this verse, you could respond in either of these two ways. Firstly, one group of people might say, well, I am not a believer, and I am not sure if faith will work. I am not even sure if God actually exists. Can he really help me? If that is you this morning, listen. Did you know that the studies have shown that 80% of what we worry about in our lives is nothing but an illusion? They say that 8 out of 10 things that we are worried about now will never actually happen. This means you are worried because you are a believer. You're already exercising your faith to be anxious. You are just believing in wrong things. The other group of people would say, well, I'm a Christian, and I've prayed many times that God would fix my problem, but my prayers never work. If this is you, can I gently say this? You have not probably tried the way David prayed. Here in this particular verse, David does not say, God, here is why I am this way. Heal me and fix my problem. No, no, no. In this particular verse, we see David prays, God, you are my shield, my glory, and my head lifter. In his prayer, David focuses on who God is, not what his problem is. 
What this means is that David recognizes God as the source of his personhood. What does the shield mean? It means protection. It means security. In saying this, David sees God as the source of his security, not his throne. Then David says, God, you are my glory. What is glory? It means significance. In his prayer, David says, God, people have deserted me. No one likes me anymore, but that is okay because I know that you still love me. Then David says, God, you are the lifter of my head. In other words, David is saying, God, I might have failed as a king and father, but I know you are still proud of me. When Daniel was born, my father flew in to visit us to see the baby. He was working in India at that time. When he came, I was going through a very interesting season of life. Gabby and I had just moved to a new city. We had just had a new baby, and I had just become a new minister. I was a little bit overwhelmed by all the changes in my life, and I was not sure if what I was doing was okay as a new dad, new minister, and husband. I questioned everything that I did. I became easily irritated and I felt nothing was actually in my control. And I got very easily upset with the small little things. Then it was the night before my father left us. He and I sat at a table and we had a chat. At the end, my father looked into my eyes and said, You left your home when you were 18. Look at you now. You're a dad, you have a family, you have a job that helps people. Look at you now. I am proud of you. Although my father was not very happy about how much money that I make as a pastor, (laughs) he said that he was proud of me. Those five words melted me, and I had to try very hard to hold back tears. His words actually made me think, okay, I've got this. I can actually do this. I will be fine. When David was anxious and questioning everything about himself and what he was doing, he prayed. In other words, he had a chat with God. And then he realized that he still had God even when his world was falling apart and everything that he loved was being taken away. He heard God saying to him, David, you still have me. You'll never lose me. I still love you. I was always with you. And I know what you are going through right now. Don't you see, I will be always with you. David, you've come this far, and I am proud of you. That's what he heard. David prayed. He was a believer. He placed his faith in God's words, not the words of his enemy. And that got David out of despair. Friends, as someone said, what What we fear the most reveals what we value the most. It's been hurting for you because you loved and you cared. But look at the text. There is the one who is the true source of your security, your worth, and your identity. And that is God. He is better than our spouses. He is better than our children. He is better than our career. He is better than our health. He is better than our ministry. He will never leave us nor forsake us. Our world may fall apart, but what is that with us? We still have God. God is your shield. He is your glory. And he is the lifter of your head. Don't believe in the words of the enemy. 
place your faith in God's words? Would you put your faith in Him? Look at what faith in God does. Enables David to say this. He says, I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. I will read it one more time, but this time I want you to join with me. Let us read this verse together in faith. Can we do that? I will not fear though, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. Then you might ask Noah, how can you be so sure of his love? How can you be so sure that he will never leave us nor forsake us? How do you know God is a better and more trustworthy shield than my bank account or my career? On what basis are you making this claim? Let's go to verse 8. It states, from the Lord comes deliverance. When David wrote this psalm, led by the Holy Spirit, he did not have a full understanding of what he was led to write here. But we do. The word salvation here translates the Hebrew word Yeshua. This word is significant because it is the name of whom the Apostle John in the New Testament calls God who became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and that is Jesus. Many centuries later, after David wrote this poem, God entered a point in human history, became like us, and lived like us. And he had one mission. His name itself says what the mission was. Salvation. Yeshua. Jesus. He came to save us. To save you. On the night before Jesus was crucified, knowing what kind of death that he would undergo, Jesus became incredibly anxious. His sweat was like drops of blood, and yet he did not run away. He still went on the cross to die for our brokenness and our sin, so that you and I may be free. From the Lord comes salvation, the last verse says. And Jesus came, died, and rose from the dead for you. This is why you and I can be so sure of God's love for us. Look to the cross. Don't you see how worthy you are to God? God gave his life to redeem you. How can we say that we do not know what the future holds for us looking at the cross and the empty tomb? When we die here, we don't leave home, but we go home. And we will be resurrected one day as Jesus was. One that is fully loved, accepted, forgiven, and redeemed in Jesus Christ. That is who you are. That is who you are. Are you going through a dark night? How about we do what David did? How about we turn our eyes upon Jesus and pray? And let's do that now. Please join me in prayer. Paul wrote this in Philippians chapter 4. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You know, friends, peace 
does not mean that you don't have problems. Peace means that your problems do not have you. Let that grab you. Let your pro- don't let your problem have a grip on you. Put your faith in the word of God, which is alone true. My Father, we come to you this morning, knowing that you are our shield, our glory, and the one that who lifts our heads high. Holy Spirit, would you help us that we may have our eyes fixed on you. As one hymn writer wrote, when our eyes are on you, the things of this world, the strange, strangely dim away, go away and fade away. I speak to us, O oh God, speak to your children this morning, that they may lift their head to fix their eyes on you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.